Floating pennywort or floating marsh pennywort is going to be found in, you guessed it, in marshes and wet land type areas. I've seen this stuff survive in clay that is very dry and cracky and hard and it seems to persevere year after year. Hydrocotyl ranunculoides, otherwise known as marsh pennywort. It's hard to distinguish whether this is an Aralaceae or an Apiaceae as far as the family is concerned of uh, these plants. Uh, the leaf pattern, those types of things are very similar and so you will see it as Apiaceae or Aralaceae. And these, when submerged in muddy, mucky water like this, will actually produce these, these leaves here. And fairly easily, they grow quite well. And as you can see, there are many wildlife and nutria and those types of animals and things around here. And for me, it kind of grosses me out. If I had to eat this, and if it was you know, maybe in a, a cleaner environment, or even if it wasn't, I would probably just boil these things if I really wanted to eat them. Yeah, so just as I said earlier, I wouldn't be eating these in an incredible amount, especially in this area here, uh, just due to, I mean, I don't think anybody dumps any chemicals and stuff like that in here. And usually plants are great at filtering out certain things, I mean, besides chemicals, they do biomagnify in some ways with chemicals, but, as far as like diseases, parasites, those things, uh, you just have to look topically. You got you got to make sure that you're getting it from a, a good area. And so again, I won't be eating a ton of these, uh, but for your viewing pleasure, uh, some pennywort here, floating marsh pennywort. So uh, we'll see how it tastes. How does it taste? Yeah, it has a distinctive taste, much much like raw carrot like raw carrot skin, mixed with like a, a parsley leaf flavor. Like carrot greens, that's what it tastes like. And you can eat this entire plant. You can eat the, the stem, the leaf, and the roots. It's all edible and palatable. It does have that bitter taste though, so make sure if that's something you find as a turn off or a put off, then this plant probably isn't for you. As you saw though, and for the forager in you, there are a ton growing next to each other. And so if you do, you know, get hungry and uh, you're out in the wilderness or in a marshy area and you've got nothing to eat, this may be a good food. Boil them, you know, I, I can't overemphasize that enough. Get them boiled or cooked somehow and man, yummy. Again, you don't have to be a purist or Tarzan in order to be a forager. Uh, you know, and, and you'll get a lot of flack for this, as I have in the past. But boil what you get. People think that the wilderness is the cleanest place that you can eat food. And in a lot of respects, I mean, I, I would agree with that, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. And so you, you have to, as a smart forager or somebody who gets their vegetables, their wild greens, plants that you consume and put in your body, you know, take an extra step. It's not going to hurt you. All right, and finally, let's combine the vitamin mineral content with also the medicinal properties and let's just go all in one. So these plants are actually very, very good for uh, cardiovascular health. They say they have anti-aging properties. Now, I don't know if that's topical or if that's, you know, internal. I would assume that it's for topical use when it comes to that. Maybe help with wrinkles and, and those things. Uh, but cardiovascular, respiratory health. And again, they're from the carrot family. And so very similar vitamin and mineral properties there.